Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Royal Armouries Museum. My name is Andrew, and I'm a member of the Live Interpretation Department. Our job is to bring to life the arms and the armour in the collection, and indeed, different periods of history. Now, I'm currently dressed as a British soldier of the Second World War, and in a moment, I'm going to take on the character of a soldier that landed on the beaches of Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day, part of Operation Overlord, which remains the largest military invasion of all times. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you're about to hear is not a script. It is taken directly from the memoirs of two soldiers fighting for the Green Howards that landed on Gold Beach at six o'clock in the morning on the first wave. So what you're effectively about to hear are the voices of the people who were there. Now we were tented somewhere in Essex. We were among the assault troops on the invasion. Now we sort of knew that one of our roles was going to involve rapid movement because a few weeks before D-Day, the entire company from the commanding officer downwards, was issued with folding bicycles. I mean, we didn't think much of it at the time. Well, I mean, you're not paid to think, are you? You just do it, accept it. Long marches and cross-country runs were involved in our training. Now, the importance of good feet, well, that was essential. So every morning, I marched out in football pitches, where an interesting period was spent soaking our feet in methylated spirits in our mess tins, coupled with soaping our socks and, and putting dubbing on our boots. Must have looked a bit strange, but it paid dividends. Now, when we actually left camp, all the locals were laughing and waving. Mrs. Larkin from Larkin's Sweet Shop. Well, she was chucking us packets of cigs and, and chocolates and peanuts. We'd catch her and shout back, thank you, darling. Now, all the older people, they were stood by the curb, crying, saying, Good luck, boys. God bless. I mean, needless to say, it was a, a somber moment for us all. Now, when we actually got on board ship, there was a long wait. Well, the invasion was delayed. So we passed the time playing cards, singing songs, that sort of thing. A couple of the boys, they brought math organs. And they'd play and we'd sing, and pretty soon the song was all over the ship. Everyone was clambering up on deck just to join in on the singing. Mind you, it was amazing how quiet the ship fell at night. I mean, I realised I was going to be part of something big. Yeah. I didn't realise how big. Although, when you stood up on deck and you looked around you, you couldn't see anything but boats. North, east, south, west. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting. I just know that what I saw was not what I expected. Now, one evening, the commanding officer addresses us. Now, what I don't want is people picking up wounded men and taking them back just to get back on board ship. If they're wounded, there are people there who will look after them. And if your pals are wounded, leave them. The objects get as far inland as possible. We must not hang around on the beach. The most dangerous place will be on that beach so take my advice, advance as far forwards as possible. If there's to be any enemy fire, 
It'll be on that beach. So the sooner you get off the beach, the happier I will be and the safer you will be. Well, good luck, gentlemen. Godspeed. I mean, see, funny thing is, none of us actually talked about our chances, you know. I mean, I heard a couple of people say, if I get shot, I hope I get shot in the head. Well, I mean, nobody wanted to get shot in the stomach. Or the private, or lose a limb. I mean, nobody wanted that. I'd never seen action before, so I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know just how horrific it was going to be. During the crossing, in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep. So I walked up on deck and I looked out in front of me and there was absolutely nothing. Just sea. And then I turned around and the place was absolutely packed with pinpoint lights. Most extraordinary thing. Now, next morning, we started firing. Just after six. And I mean, everybody opened up. The noise. God, it was horrific. Ear shattering. I mean, we'd never experienced anything like it. Cruise ships, assault ships, frigates, destroyers. They're all thumping away at the shore. Bomber aircraft are coming overhead. And then as soon as it was daylight, well, we had to get on them boats. Now, we were just loading them up when there was this God almighty bang. Saw this destroyer get blown up. I mean, it went down in, in under two minutes. I mean, we couldn't do anything for the crew. Well, they were about half a mile away. There were plenty of other ships around. But it was our first taste of war. And it sort of hits you in the guts. Every now and again, there were terrific explosions from shore, which by now, it's just a large haze of smoke and small fires. I distinctly remember experiencing the same sort of stomach before going into battle. I mean, that wasn't the worst, though. Well, the landing craft, they were flat-bottomed. And they're lifting up into the air and banging back down again. I mean, everybody was spewing over everybody else. I mean, God, I was keen to get off the damn thing, even though I knew I was going into battle. There was a sharp crackling and machine gun fire, and I quickly got my head down after taking a quick look. There were shells bursting right the way across the front. And we're in range now of mortar fire. I mean, this was a weapon we'd learned to respect in the past. I saw one Higgins boat take a direct hit. And it was just completely disintegrated. Just disappeared in this red mist about 100 yards from the shore, and the bloke in charge of our landing craft, he shouts out, watch yourself as you get off the ramp, might crush your feet. And then down went the ramp, and out went the captain, with me close behind. Now we're in the sea, up to the tops of our thighs. Now the water, I mean, it, it struck cold at first. But I soon forgot that, in frantic efforts to keep my feet. I mean, the water was only four feet deep, 
but there were bomb craters and shell holes that made it eight feet deep in places. And you just never knew when you were going into one. But also, there were dead bodies under the water. I mean, these can throw you over. I felt the wind of a bullet go under my nose and between my fingers. It just broke the skin. I mean, the most, most terrific feeling. The wind, the sting of a bullet. Now, when I got to the water's edge, there were all these chaps from the previous units. They're all just, just dead. All dying. And swilling around in this blood red water. I mean, there were no shouts. No. Because everybody knew their job. And they were doing it to the best of their ability without saying a word. Just the occasional cry of despair as men were hit and went down. I mean, the entire beach was filled with half-bent running figures. Now, there was a, a long, a hundred, maybe a hundred and fifty yards between the water's edge and the concrete wall. Now, if you could reach that wall, I mean, you were safe. Well, for a while at least, from enemy fire. But I sat there, under cover, behind this, this iron cross. And I watched. I watched, absolutely petrified. I watched as so many brave men didn't make it. And there they all lay in the sand, dead, or horrifically wounded. Some of them were screaming out for their mums. Now there's this flail tank of ours that had already landed and, and it's crunching its way up the sand and suddenly it just exploded. I mean, whether from a, a shell or a mine, I don't know. But one of its wheels came off and it rolled right the way across the beach. Just missed one of our sergeants. It was lying there with, with a wound in his leg and, and half his jaw blown off. Now there's this sweet, rancid smell and, and it's absolutely everywhere and never forgotten by those who smell it. Burnt explosives, torn flesh, ruptured earth. A couple of our larger tanks that had landed, they're working their way up. Now there are these lads, they're lying there. I mean, they're undercover, only they've been there for some time, see? Well, none of them could hear anything anymore. So they couldn't hear the tanks coming. And I just saw them just get run over, crushed to death. I made a break for it, and I ran past this military policeman, and he says, get down, soldier, it's dangerous. So I got down again. And he, he just continued to stand there, you know, directing traffic. Now the Navy, they started firing at the pillboxes in our area. There were these 12, 16 inch shells and they were coming over the top and then they were landing not 30 or 40 yards from us. Now these shells, 
as they came over, they, they created a, a sort of a vacuum. And it literally lifted you up out of the hole. I mean, I literally remember being lifted up as they went over and then sort of slammed back down again as they exploded. I mean, the concussion. It was just beyond belief. And this went on and on. Well, for a considerable length of time. I was deaf for three days afterwards. Now, me and some others, we managed to reach the wall. This pillbox on our left, it, it flattened us with its spandau. But that was quite quickly silenced, really. And then we got on. We reached these roads, and we turned right, and we ran. Well, as fast as our kit and equipment would allow us. Now, if a German soldier appeared, everybody fired at him. I mean, it was no bother. Well, I mean, we, we didn't see him as human beings, you see. Even though, even though they were just like me, really. See, you're there, right? Everybody's shouting and screaming, and you see this figure, and you fire. Yeah. Yeah, I shot people. I mean, a bloke, a hundred. 150 yards away. Well, he's an awful big target. Only you don't just fire once. You fire and you reload and again and again and another and you don't stop firing even after he's gone down. Because it's you or him. Every single time, it's you or him. See, I think what war teaches you is how terrific human hate can be. I mean, because it's clearly insane, this spectacle of men and machines trying to destroy each other. It's really quite hideously insane. I mean, one wonders whether there's any future for an animal that can actually do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to dedicate that piece to all those that lost their lives during the Second World War and an entire generation that were affected by it. Thank you.